My name is Katie Harrington. I'm a postdoc at the University of Michigan working with Jeff McMahon. We do a bunch of different things there. What I'm primarily focusing on is the integration and testing of the ladder optics tubes. So this is a, let's see. So from the Simons Observatory, there's two different types of telescopes. There's the large aperture telescope, which is a six meter dish that's going to be, actually several dishes, um, that's going to be out in the Atacama. And then there's also three or um, smaller, small aperture telescopes called the SATs. And I'm actually working on developing a test setup for ensuring that the optics tubes, which holds all the lenses and the detectors, so something like a camera for the, teles for the LAT telescope, uh, I need to ensure that those lenses and the filtering and the detectors and all those things are working as we design them to, so that when we take them down to Chile and put them in this like car-sized cryogenic receiver, that they're actually going to work out. So this meeting is about kind of the plan for doing all of the integration and testing for the small aperture telescopes. So um, the small aperture guys are in the background. Um, they're, they're small, but their windows are this big. So that's only a relatively small um, relative to the lat, which is six meters or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so anytime you're going to take all of these random components that individuals have tried, designed all across a whole different field, all across the entire collaboration, there's, I don't know, remember the number of institutions, it's probably like 80 at this point. So there's a lot of people working on these projects and we're all working on different pieces and eventually when we put it all together it needs to work. And so that's the kind of integration and testing idea where, um, yeah, you get it all working. And so this meeting here was to plan that to figure out which tests you had to do, which pieces needed to be verified, which pieces um, just needed to be assembled together, what were like quick validations, what were difficult things, which things had to be done in lab, or which things could wait till when we went out to Chile. Uh, because when you go to Chile, you get, there's a lot of great things that, you know, the sky you look at in Chile is the sky you planned for, whereas when you're in lab, you're looking at a whole different, like, you're not looking at the sky, you're looking at 300 Kelvin, uh, and that adds lots of complications. Um, so it's a bunch of like prioritizing, planning, and getting ready to go so that when we actually stick everything in a bunch of boxes, put it on a boat, send it down to Chile, and drive it up a mountain, go up to 17,000 feet, put it all together up there while we're in half atmosphere, uh, that it's going to work. One of the things that have happened in our field has been a development for really, really good anti-reflection coatings. These are um, just, just mechanisms of making sure that when the microwave light hits the lens, as much as possible goes through it and very little is reflected off. Uh, and so the anti-reflection coatings are something that we make at Michigan where um, we actually use a saw and it's like a, a dicing saw, something that you would use for like cutting circuit boards and things, but we've tricked it out and it is no longer, it no longer looks anything like that. Um, and what we're doing is we're cutting these pillars type, type things. They're actually like blocks. You should get some photos of them. They're quite cool. Um, and what we're doing, and we're making these little features, these little pillars type things that are sub-wavelength. So our wavelengths of light are millimeters. And we're making things that are a third and a fourth and a fifth, you know, of these wavelengths. Um, because when you make things that are smaller than the wavelength, the light can't see them. They, it sees the average. And so these average um, layers, you change the density of these materials in a very specifically engineered way so that um, you get the like correct like properties of light, um, like properties of the material so that um, uh, much, much, much more of the light is transmitted through these lenses instead of reflected. I originally actually went to college thinking I was going to be an engineering major. So uh, I kind of actually switched back and forth between thinking I'd do aerospace engineering or electrical engineering. But somewhere in the middle of my, the end of my freshman year, early sophomore year, some of my friends were asking me to continue taking physics classes with them because like, I'd enjoyed them and they wanted basically partners in these classes. So we ended up signing up for a cosmology class uh, that was taught by Alan Guth, who started the theory of inflation way back in the 80s. And um, as we're going through there, I just kind of ended up loving it. The class was amazing. I learned a bunch. 
and I was finding myself more interested in it than any of my like in major electrical engineering degree classes. So I ended up switching my major over to physics. Um, I still like doing all the engineering hands-on type work. I would still do that as a hobby type stuff kind of around around campus doing random things in undergrad, right? Um, and so then at in my junior year, I was taking our version of the advanced lab class where you do a bunch of physics experiments from, say, the 20th century and newer, so like the new cool stuff that's going on. Um, and I ended up getting a summer job working on fixing some of these experiments for this lab class. And that kind of took my engineering things that I'd still enjoyed and put it right back into uh, physics and kind of mix the two up, which CMB instrumentation, what I do now is almost that exact same mix of physics and engineering. And so I loved that, kept going with that sort of thing, and then started applying for grad schools, looking, not really sure what I wanted to do. I, that original cosmology interest that got me into physics kept me go, you know, that was sort of what I was looking for. Um, and then just got a call from who, the person who ended up being my thesis advisor telling me about this really cool new project. Uh, this was actually CLASS. It's the Cosmology Large Angular Scale Surveyor, which is was, is out of Johns Hopkins, which is where I went to grad school. Um, yeah, so Toby calls me up and says, hey, let me tell you about this really cool project we're doing. And it was this kind of perfect blend of engineering, physics, trying to build something before that no one else has ever done, uh, all this fun combination of stuff that just like got me hooked. I mean, the thing that drew me to cosmology in general was just like, uncovering fundamental factors of the universe. Um, so one of the science goals actually that I've been most interested in has been the, these primordial gravitational waves from inflation, which is uh, the thing that actually the SAT is most likely to um, be able to set constraints on. And this is, you know, it's like the idea that the universe expanded from like tiny, tiny, you know, well below the size of an atom to like galaxies and larger uh, in like zero time, like very, very quickly. Um, and like that's a really cool idea and like if that, and this inflationary expansion, um, it solves so many problems with like the standard model of cosmology that it, it's practically become the standard model of cosmology except we need to prove that it happened. Uh, and so there are these, you know, there are these clues that, if it happened, would have been left in the universe. Um, there's a bunch of things we've already seen. The tensor, the um, scalar index is, of, is something that we've really already seen is where we would expect it to be if this inflationary expansion happened. Um, but there's other explanations for why that could be there. And so this, these Primordial gravitational waves is the thing that we expect inflation would have created while this massive fast expansion was happening. So you'd expect um, quantum fluctuations in gravity to then be expanded up to size scales of the universe. But we're looking for evidence that they existed. Um, and if you do that, then like you have to explain like how what could have this happened? And one of the only really explanation is inflation. Um, so just like trying to under uncover these like cool things that might have happened or could be happening and understanding like how the universe works. Like maps of the CMB can tell you like everything from how old the universe is to how much how like how much baryonic matter there is versus how much dark matter there is. Um, which is like also this cool massive mystery like what is dark matter? I don't know. Uh, and all this other cool stuff. So that's like, there's a bunch of interesting fun things there that like we get to do while also getting to play with really fun toys and hang out in machine shops and uh, go to the top of mountains in the middle of nowhere in Chile uh, and all this other cool random stuff.